down at one side. The Blessed One then asked them, Bhikkhus, is it true that you have been taken to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, that you can neither convince each other nor be, nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others? Yes, Venerable Sir. Bhikkhus, what do you think? When you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, do you on that occasion maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind, in public and in private, towards your companions in the holy life? No, Venerable Sir. So, Bhikkhus, when you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, on that occasion you do not maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind, in public and in private, towards your companions in the holy life. Misguided men, what can you possibly know, what can you see, that you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers? that you can neither convince each other nor be, be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Misguided men, that will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. <clears throat> then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, there are these six principles of cordiality that create love and respect and conduce to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. What are the six? Here, a bhikkhu maintains bodily acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to con cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Again, a bhikkhu maintains verbal acts of loving-kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This, too, is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Again, a bhikkhu maintains mental acts of loving-kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This, too, is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Again, a bhikkhu uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life. Without making reservations, he shares with them any gain of a kind that accords with the Dhamma and has been obtained in a way that accords with the Dhamma, including even the mere contents of his bowl. This, too, is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life those virtues that are unbroken, untorn, unblotched, unmottled, liberating, commanded by the wise, not misapprehended, and conducive to concentration. This, too, is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life that view that is noble and emancipating and leads one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. This, too, is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. These are the six principles of cordiality that create love and respect and conduce to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Of these six principles of cordiality, the chief 
the most cohesive, the most unifying, is this view that is noble and emancipating, and which leads the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. Just as the chief, the most cohesive, the most unifying part of a pinnacled house is the pinnacle itself, so too, of these six principles of cordiality, the chief is this view that is noble and emancipating. And how does this view that is noble and emancipating lead the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering? Here a bhikkhu, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, considers thus. Is there any obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know or see things as they actually are? If a bhikkhu is obsessed by sensual lust, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by ill will, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by sloth and torpor, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by restlessness and remorse, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by doubt, then his mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu is absorbed in speculation about this world, then his mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu is, obsessed, is absorbed <coughs> in speculation about the other world, then his mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu takes to quarreling and brawling and is deep in a dispute, stabbing others with verbal daggers, then his mind is obsessed. He understands thus, there is no obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are. My mind is well disposed for awakening to the truths. This is the first knowledge attained by him that is noble, supermundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, When I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, do I personally obtain serenity? Do I personally obtain quenching? <coughs> he understands thus, When I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, I personally obtain serenity. I personally obtain quenching. This is the second knowledge obtain, attained by him that is noble, supermundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus. Is there any other recluse or Brahman outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess? He understands. <coughs> there is no other recluse or Brahman outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed by a view such as I possess. This is the third knowledge attained by him that is noble, supermundane, not shared by ordinary people. <coughs> Again, a noble disciple considers thus, Do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down, still he at once <coughs> confesses, reveals, and discloses it to the teacher or to wise companions in the holy life. And having done that, he enters upon restraint for the future. Just as a young, tender infant lying prone at once draws back when he puts his hand or his foot on a live coal, so too that is the character of a person who possesses right view. He understands thus. I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This is the fourth knowledge attained by him that is noble, supermundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I, <coughs> do I possess the character of a, of a person who possesses right view? <coughs> what is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may be active in various matters for his companions in the holy life, 
Yet he has a keen regard for training in the higher virtue, training in the higher mind, and training in the higher wisdom. Just as a cow with a new calf, while she grazes, watches her calf, so too that is the character of a person who possesses right view. He understands thus. I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This is the fifth knowledge attained by him that is noble, supermundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus. Do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he heeds it, gives it attention, engages it with all his mind, hears the Dhamma as with eager ears. He understands. I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the sixth knowledge attained by him that is noble, supermundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus. Do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the seventh knowledge attained by him that is noble, supermundane, not shared by ordinary people. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he has well sought the character for realization of the fruit of stream entry. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he possesses the fruit of stream entry. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. <coughs> So I've always had a soft spot for that that discourse, that teaching. Um, and it touches on so many things, both in terms of uh, the uh, <coughs> communal practice, communal harmony, but as well as uh, personal uh, personal practice. That's Majima 48, Kosambiya Sutta. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, worthy of, of uh, uh, reviewing and reflecting. <coughs> okay. A number of years ago, it was from Ajahn Matiko, and he, he was surprised that I hadn't heard it before because he said that in Thailand it's a, one that's often talked about and presented and discussed uh, amongst the gurus. Uh -huh. And I didn't know if you would experience that as well or you know, just with more of a personal favor. More of a personal favor? Yeah, that's that's to me that's one of the really refreshing 
uh, kind of aspects of that. It's not some philosophical idea or it's not some cosmological kind of uh, go around it. It's really this is what it uh, this is this is how it plays out. And this is what what practicing according to Dhamma and Vinaya actually results in. It's really yeah, to me very inspiring. This is a continuing on, and this is from the the Vinaya, the Mahavaga. It's also in the Udana. Now, when the Blessed One had instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged them with talk on the Dhamma, he rose from his seat. He set out to wander by stages to Parileyaka. At length, in the course of wandering, he arrived there, and he went to live in the Rakita jungle at the foot of an auspicious sala tree. While he was alone in retreat, this thought arose in his mind. Formerly, I lived in discomfort, pestered by those Kosambi bhikkhus who quarrel, 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 brawl, wrangle, harangue, and litigate in the midst of the Sangha. Now I am alone and companionless, living at ease and in comfort, away from all of them. There was also a certain tusker elephant who had been living, pestered by elephants and cow elephants and calf elephants and sucking elephants, and he had been eating grass with bruised ends and broken up bits of branches, and he had been drinking dirty water, and his body had been jostled by cow elephants as he came up out of the bathing place. He had considered all this and he thought, why should I not live alone, withdrawn from the crowd? And so he had left the herd and had gone to Parileyaka, to the Rakita jungle, to the root of the auspicious sala tree where the Blessed One was. He looked after the Blessed One, providing food and drink for him. And with his trunk, he cleared the leaves away he thought, formerly I lived pestered by elephants, and goes through it all again. Now, alone and withdrawn from the herd, I live at ease and in comfort away from all those elephants. The Blessed One, relishing his own seclusion, became aware in his mind of the thought in the Tusker elephant's mind. He uttered this exclamation. Tusker agrees with Tusker here. The elephant with tusks as long as shafts delights alone in woods. Their hearts are thus in harmony. <coughs> then there is a, uh, um, uh, from the uh, uh, sutta, uh, from the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya 22, Sutta number 81. Soon after the Blessed One had left Kosambi, a certain bhikkhu went to the Venerable Ananda and said, Friend Ananda, <coughs> the Blessed One has put his resting place in order, and he has taken his bowl and outer robe and set out to wander alone and unaccompanied without informing his attendants or taking leave of the Sangha bhikkhus. Friend, when the Blessed One does that, then he wants to live alone, and he must not be followed by anyone. Sometime later, a number of bhikkhus went to the Venerable Ananda and said, Friend Ananda, <coughs> it is long since we heard a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. We should like to hear that. <coughs> So the Venerable Ananda went with those bhikkhus to the Blessed One at the root of the auspicious sala tree at Parilayaka, and after paying homage, they sat down at one side. Then the Blessed One encouraged them with talk on the Dhamma. And then 
and this is from the Mahavaga, the Ravinya. When the Blessed One had stayed at Parilayaka as long as he chose, he set out to wander by stages to Savati. In the course of his wandering, he at length arrived there, and he went to live in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindaka's Park. Meanwhile, the lay followers of Kosambi thought, These <coughs> venerable Kosambi bhikkhus are doing us great harm. They have plagued the Blessed One till he has gone away. Let us no longer pay homage to them, or rise up for them, or give them res reverential salutation, <coughs> or treat them with courtesy. Let us not honor, respect, revere, or venerate them. Let us give them no more alms food, even when they come for it. So when they, got, so when they get no honor, respect, reverence, or veneration from us, when they're regularly ignored, they will either go elsewhere, or leave the Sangha, or make amends to the Blessed One. They acted accordingly. <coughs> In consequence, the Kosambi Bhikkhus decided, let us go to Savati, friends, and settle this litigation in the Blessed One's presence. So they put the resting places in order, took the bowls and outer robes, and set out for Savati. The Venerable Sariputta heard that they were coming. He went to the Blessed One and asked, Lord, it seems that those Kosambi bhikkhus who quarrel, brawl, dispute, wrangle, and litigate in the midst of the Sangha are coming here to Savati. How am I to, how am I to treat them, Lord? Keep to the Dhamma, Sariputta. Lord, how am I to know what is Dhamma and what is not? There are 18 instances in which one who says what is not Dhamma can be recognized. Here a bhikkhu shows what is not Dhamma as Dhamma and what is Dhamma as not Dhamma. He shows what is not the discipline as the discipline and what is the discipline as not the discipline. He shows what has not been stated by the perfect one as so stated and what has been stated by the perfect one as not so stated. He shows what is not practiced by the perfect one as so practiced and he shows the opposite. He shows what has not been made known by the perfect one as so made known and he shows the opposite. He shows what is not an offense as an offense and what is an offense as not an offense. He shows a slight offense as a grave one and a grave offense as a slight one. He shows an offense with remainder as one without and an offense without remainder as one with. He shows a serious offense as not serious and one not serious as serious. One who says, says what is Dhamma can be known in the opposite way. The Venerable Maha Mokalana, the Venerable Maha Kasapa, the Venerable Maha Kachana, the Venerable Maha Kotita, the Venerable Maha Kapinna, the Venerable Maha Chunda, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Revata, the Venerable Upali, the Venerable Ananda, and the Venerable Rahula heard that they were coming. They each went to the Blessed One and received the same instructions. Mahapajapati, Gautami, heard about it, and she went to the Blessed One and asked how she was to treat them. Hear the Dhamma from both sides, Gautami. When you have done so, approve the views, the liking, the opinions, and judgments of those who say what is Dhamma. What the Sangha Bhikkhunis has to expect from the Sangha Bhikkhus should be expected from those who speak according to Dhamma. Anatta Pindaka and Visaka, Mikara's mother, heard about it and they went to the Blessed One for advice. He told them, give gifts to both sides, approve the views of those who speak according to Dhamma. Eventually, the Kosambi bhikkhus arrived at Savati. The Venerable Sariputta went to the Blessed One and asked, Lord, it seems that those Kosambi bhikkhus have arrived at Savati. How should they be accommodated for lodging? Lodge them secluded from each other. But if there are no secluded lodgings, Lord, what is to be done? Then allot them 
after having had them made secluded. Sorry, Buddha. I say, however, that in no circumstances should a resting place be denied to a senior bhikkhu. Whoever does so commits an offense of wrongdoing. But, Lord, what is to be done about food and so on? Food and so on must be shared out equally with all. <coughs> now, while the suspended bhikkhu was reflecting on the discipline, it occurred to him, that was an offense, not no offense. I have, I have offended. I am suspended. I have been suspended by a lawful act that cannot be quashed and is fit to stand. Then he went to the supporter. Then he went to his supporters and told them this, and he said, "So the venerable ones may reinstate me." His followers then took him to the blessed one, and after paying homage, they sat down at one side. They recounted what the suspended bhikkhu had said, and they asked, "Lord, how shall we act?" Bhikkhus. That was an offense and not no offense. He has offended. He is suspended. <coughs> he has been suspended by a lawful act that cannot be quashed and is fit to stand. Since that bhikkhu who has committed that offense and has been suspended has seen it, you can reinstate him. Then after the followers of the suspended bhikkhu had reinstated him, they went to the bhikkhus who had suspended him, and they said, Friends, about that case over which there was quarreling and disunion in the Sangha, the bhikkhu has committed an offense, he has been suspended. Now he has seen it, and he has been reinstated. Let us, ha let us have an act of settlement before the Sangha in order to close the matter. Then the bhikkhus who had done the suspending went to the Blessed One and told him what had occurred. The pro proposed act of settlement was approved and the procedure laid down. And that's the end of that. Of course, the procedure is actually doing the... In the end, after all the various motions and announcements and, 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 and settling and whatnot, then they to uh, do the patimoka together. That's the um, kind of the, the so one gets a sense of the the importance that the Buddha places on that that patimoka, the uposatta uh, ceremony. <coughs> okay. Any questions, comments? In your experience with disputes, did you try not to uh, try to let those be worked out uh, th themselves in the community unless you had to step in, try not to micromanage? I've heard that teaching, like from Ajahn Chan, Ajahn Sumedho, that they tried to, you know, let people sort of make the mistakes and learn from them, perhaps, and work it out rather than get involved. And I'm, well, I'm sure it depends. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be some small things. Um, and so that you try to deal with that with, from a from Dhamma perspective, and try to get people to reflect and investigate. And, uh, and then also the, um, and then also trying to get people to communicate and mediate um, is, is very important. <coughs> but, uh, you know, there's some times where, <coughs> you know, I've never ever seen a case where it's come to a place of, like, like in this, where there's, they're really at loggerheads and, and there's suspensions and, and, uh, and, and whatnot. And, uh, um, Usually, I mean, the Sangha is so large, especially in Thailand, Sangha is so large that uh, people just leave and go somewhere else. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that, uh, um, you know, which is maybe not the most, say, the greatest long-term solution, but 
uh, sometimes that's all that's workable. Because <clears throat> people have to commit to to uh, to a process of reconciliation, and, and sometimes it's just not possible. <clears throat> you know, there's you know, well, you know, I've had to deal with a variety of situations and months. There, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and, and also sometimes it's just sort of like, um, you know, Paul was really good at not, no was was really good at not casting people out, um, and uh, you know, really trying because sometimes uh, there's just a cooling off period. Okay, separation, cooling off period. And then coming back, one can reestablish and, uh, and communicate and, and reconcile. I've seen that so many times. <coughs> um, and, uh, but, you know, there are some real, there are some people who are just really sick. <laughs> and, uh, and it, it uh, and then it's just whatever you do, it just, it's, it's just, it just doesn't work. <clears throat> well, Papan is probably the, one of the only sadhus that actually follows some of these, I think. Yeah. Yeah, in their junior meetings, and I've seen yeah. they actually done litigation like this. It's quite inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's. Uh, <coughs> it's like okay, if you want to go start your own place at two bosses, okay, if you we'll give you a year to come and ask forgiveness and yeah. live here again. If you don't, you're out of the. Yeah. You're, you're out on of your own. Walk alongside. It. Yeah. So like things like that. It's important to swear. Yeah, that that. Uh, uh, Ajahn Chah was, was that, because the Buddha himself was laid down at the end of his life, uh, one of the, and say the basis for communal harmony, <coughs> and one of them is, is uh, meeting off, and uh, what Bhagavan tends to, to uh, follow that with having, I mean, it's a very diverse and very large community. <coughs> anyway, is it perfect? Absolutely not. But it does pretty good uh, with the, the diversity of people that it has, and, and uh, there is a willingness to to, to, to work together. Um, and, and if there isn't, then yeah, never plenty to bear. Um, and it's unfortunate, but, but yeah, it has to work on both sides. You can't force it. Inspiring too because it's not like a bunch of hotheads getting together. It's actually like people have a lot of good input and obviously nodding, kind of agreeing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's quite quite good. Yeah.